three days of investigation, Shelby Wilkie is still missing. Detectives sure suspect Michael Wilkie murdered her, but there's no body, and they aren't ready to arrest him. So now comes the moment of truth. First of all, thanks for coming in and chatting with me. At 4.11 in the afternoon, Thursday, January 5th, Michael Wilkie volunteers to come into the Henderson County Sheriff's Office and submit to what will be about six hours of questioning from Sergeant Andrew Anderson. He's a master interrogator. He wanted to be there, it seemed like, and he was ready to talk. Up to now, Wilkie has been so cooperative, maybe he really is innocent. Or is he just convinced he can talk his way out of the quicksand? Legal analyst Nancy Grace has studied the case. Michael Wilkie is painting himself into a corner with his own words, okay? Are you a baseball fan? I'm a great fan. Good man, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm the interrogation I'm begins with some ice-breaking small talk. But I love, absolutely love the Atlanta race. I've been a baseball fan and a race fan all my life. I was creating a bond with him. I wanted him to feel comfortable enough to me to be able to tell the truth about what happened to his wife. Officer, we need to find your wife. Detective Sonia Matthews is watching from down the hall as Anderson reveals to Wilkie the cops have pretty much eliminated the runaway theory. Our cell phone has ended on January 1st. Where we There's no activity. There's been no activity for the three bank accounts that we know of. Found a car, haven't found her. Doesn't look good. But he assures Wilkie he's not the only suspect. You're the only one we're looking at, okay? And so Wilkie immediately offers up someone else. I'm trying to try to be near to did you know about your mom's problem? Uh, no. Tell me about your mom. He thinks if he can just keep talking, he can outwit everybody. He starts pointing the finger at her own parents. He claims Jan had some legal trouble and that Bill demanded that he keep his mouth shut. He told me that if I ever sit there and told anybody about that, that he would kill me. So her dad threatened you? Her dad. Yeah. The parents admit there was some minor real estate problem a long time ago but say it was absurd to suggest they threaten Michael. He's trying to pass the blame to someone else, and I'll let him do that. But Anderson returns the focus to Wilkie, zeroing in now on that key question everyone wanted answered. How did he get those scratches on his face? This is the hallway, the master bedroom's back in this area, and there's like a half bath. They go through New Year's Day hour by hour, drawing where Shelby and Michael were in the house, and slowly Anderson gets Wilkie to abandon that theory that Shelby ran off. Well, yeah. It actually started in the kitchen. Wilkie begins describing an argument in that kitchen that moves to the bathroom and then to the bedroom. He admits to a physical altercation. He admitted to that. First, Wilkie says Shelby hit him. What did she do? I mean, you're showing me with your hands. Tell me what she did. And that's how you got the, the scratches and the one on the side. But there's more. Anderson extracting the truth like sap from a North Carolina maple. For the first time, Wilkie admits he hit Shelby. I mean, I pushed her back, and I'm just kind of like, just, okay, stop. You know, and she's like, you know, oh, I think, I think my nose is bleeding. When people start admitting things such as she had a bloody nose, they feel like they're not incriminating themselves, but you know the truth. The closer to the truth, the more emotional Wilkie gets. Just let it go. He weeps and yelps, but still denies killing Shelby. He has no idea where she is. The weight of your the weight is on your shoulder. How did she die? How did she die? How did she die? What happened in there? Tell me. Tell me. But he's about to learn just how much evidence the detectives have already. For example, remember that luminol, the chemical that shows blood spatter even after it's been cleaned up? Where did all that blood come from then? There's a Hail Mary. He says she committed suicide. This is all strictly a show. So why didn't he call 911? Why didn't he try to help Shelby? His story isn't adding up, especially in light of this Molotov cocktail of the revelation. So you guys came out here, and one of the officers noticed this 
big black patch right in there. Right. The cops have discovered that he set a large bonfire in his backyard. Right about where that bird feeder's at is where they saw this perfect rectangle that had been burned in the yard. About the size of a human body, it really raised our suspicions immediately when we saw it. But they still don't know where Wilkie disposed of the ashes from that fire. Basically over there, you notice something that makes you stop and think for a second. Correct. But now, 5 p.m. that afternoon, just a few miles from where Wilkie is answering questions at the sheriff's office, the investigation now leads to his parents' house, where Detective Scott Galloway is walking up a winding gravel drive in the Blue Ridge foothills, searching for the remains of Wilkie's bonfire. He's texting Detective Anderson every step of the way, particularly what he sees as he turns the corner. When we come on down the driveway here, we see what appears to us as fresh tire tracks cutting down the field. The lone tire tracks lead detectives to a 55-gallon barrel in the woods. Inside the barrel? Uh, some of them were dumped out. Ashes, some small fragments yes. of bone. Suspicious, to say the least, but the fire has burned off all DNA traces. There's no way to identify whose bones these were. Let me take what's happening. Back in the interrogation room, Detective Anderson reveals what's been found. But instead of a confession, the mountain man spins his tallest tail. He says he granted his beloved wife her final wish. It's hard to hear, but even harder to believe. He says he cremated her body after the suicide, then cleaned up to preserve her memory. How is she in the burning barrel? Yeah, the, the barrel is just whatever things that take taken been burned. Okay, that is wrong on so many levels, I hardly even know where to start. His Oscar-worthy performance is rewarded with twin bracelets. 9 p.m. Thursday night, four days after his wife Shelby vanishes, Michael Wilkie is arrested and cuffed. But this case is no layup. There was no body. We had, uh, yeah, no murder weapon. We really don't know how the homicide occurred. What would a jury make of all this at trial? Is that why Michael Wilkie is smiling, even giving the thumbs up after the verdict? Stay with us. Three days of investigation, Shelby Wilkie is still missing. Detectives sure suspect Michael Wilkie murdered her, but there's no body, and they aren't ready to arrest him. So now comes the moment of truth. First of all, thanks for coming in and chatting with me. At 4.11 in the afternoon, Thursday, January 5th, Michael Wilkie volunteers to come into the Henderson County Sheriff's Office and submit to what will be about six hours of questioning from Sergeant Andrew Anderson. He's a master interrogator. He wanted to be there, it seemed like, and he was ready to talk. Up to now, Wilkie has been so cooperative, maybe he really is innocent. Or is he just convinced he can talk his way out of the quicksand? Legal analyst Nancy Grace has studied the case. Michael Wilkie is painting himself into a corner with his own words, okay? Are you a baseball fan? I'm a baseball fan. Good, man, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. The interrogation I'm afraid. begins with some ice-breaking small talk. But I love, absolutely love the Atlanta Braves. I've been a baseball fan and a Braves fan all my life. I was creating a bond with him. I wanted him to feel comfortable enough to me to be able to tell the truth about what happened to his wife. Officer, we need to find your wife. Detective Sonia Matthews is watching from down the hall as Anderson reveals to Wilkie the cops have pretty much eliminated the runaway theory. Our cell phone has ended on January 1st. Where we mean There's no activity. There's been no activity. There's three bank accounts that we know of. Found a car. Haven't found her. Doesn't look good. But he assures Wilkie he's not the only suspect. You're not the only one we're looking at, okay? And so Wilkie immediately offers up someone else. I'm trying, I'm trying to be mean. Tell me, did you know about wrong problem? Um, no, tell me about it all. He thinks if he can just keep talking, he can outwit everybody. He starts pointing the finger at her own parents. He claims Jan had some legal trouble and that Bill demanded that he keep his mouth shut. He told me that if I ever sit there and told anybody about that, that he would kill me. So her dad threatened you? Her, yeah. The parents admit there was some minor real estate problem a long time ago, but say it was absurd to suggest they threaten Michael. He's trying to pass the blame to someone else. And I'll let him do that. But Anderson returns the focus to Wilkie, zeroing in now on that key 